What's good, YouTube? If you're watching this video, you successfully made it to layer seven of that OSI model, where we give you nothing but that application. You can apply it directly to your life. Today, this is another one of my, this interview is with another one of my mentors. He's a big brother to me. He's been someone that's guided me on the social media sphere and his personal business moves and things like that. He shares a ton of knowledge and he mentors in his own way. And he has a lot of connections because he just loves to help and network and build with people. He is a people person. Um, and as you hear his story today, you'll hear a lot of what I'm talking about in this interview. I want y'all to meet again. If you've been following my channel for a while, um, I interviewed him before, but Today, Senior Manager, Global E-Commerce Marketing Strategist at Lenovo. He's the host of the Marketplace Podcast. He's written a ton of articles, interviews, a ton of top industry writers, authors, business owners, business professionals, tech professionals, you name it. He tries to network, build, and get their story out there. My big brother, Priest Willis. Dwan, what's good, my man? Ah man, I'm blessed, man. Um, I want to thank you for taking the time today to share with the audience. Thank you, bro. Thanks for having me on sharing platform again. I, you know, you know the conversations we have separately and kind of, you know, being able to open this up in front of the people and share it publicly. You know how much you mean to me in that regard and. I, I, you know, I love what you're doing in the space and how many people you help. So I certainly love to be a part of it. So I appreciate it, man. I really do appreciate it. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is when it comes to what you do in your podcast, what made you get into creating a pod podcast and how did you um, start networking with people to build up your platform? Mm, good question. So uh, the reason why I got into podcasting was because just as it says at the intro, I'm an inquisitive guy. You know, I really do have questions beyond the book. You got that book by uh, Cal back there called Deep Work. You know, if I read that book. Yeah, right. Yep. Right over there. If I read that book and just simply read it and I still had questions after it and then I try to ask Cal, you know, if there's a discussion we could have about it. Cal would be like, you know, bro, I got stuff. I got stuff to do. You're, you're nothing. You're nobody. So creating a platform, having a podcast gives you kind of an icebreaker to get in and have those conversations. So I feel like my podcast, I'm asking all the questions that I want to know. It has nothing to do with the listener, but I'm hoping that the listener is getting some of the same answers that I'm getting and appreciating and enjoying some of the feedback that I'm getting. But that that's my main reason for having a podcast. It's selfish. I wanted to really learn, you know, how are other people budgeting? What kind of books are you reading? What are you doing? And that's a tough question just to reach out. People send you on Twitter. Will you be my mentor? Will you have a discussion with me? M more than likely, or most of the time, people at that level and, you know, ex executive levels, they're just not going to have time for you. And, you know, that's fairly stated. But this this creates a platform to kind of exchange those different things we want to discuss. Yeah, I love that. And that's a really creative way to network and build with people. Yeah, I, I really think it. I think I listen to and watch a lot of Joe Rogan. I think that's one of the reasons he started interviewing is kind of the same reason. I agree with you 100 percent. In fact, when I listen to Joe Rogan, if I had to model my style after somebody and I'm trying to evolve in that, that's that's what I want to do. Not because he's Joe Rogan. He did 100 million with Spotify. I don't care about that stuff. Right. But the way he asked questions, you could tell that he's went deep into the to the research of whatever it is that he's talking about. MMA, the universe, scientists, vaccines, whatever. 
it's those are the conversations I want to have. I talk to a guy about conspiracy theories. I have authors. I have sports people. I'm all over the place. But because we're all over the place up here, we're having all these kind of conversations and who better to have them with but subject matter experts and people along those lines. That's a really great point. I think um, because you're in the tech space um, and you've been in the tech space and we'll talk about that throughout this interview. Um, that can get kind of, I would say, redundant being in this, doing the same thing as far as in the same field, you know, but we are more than just that. You know, we have more than just uh, interest of the latest technology. You know, we're curious about finances. We're curious about, um, you know, becoming better men, becoming be better humans, fathers, husbands, all of that. And so when you can network with people and talk to people and hear people's story, I think it's um, a fascinating thing. Not only when you can get it for yourself, but when you can bring other people into the conversation. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, you know, one of the things you'll find is if people become so tunnel minded about whatever it is that they're studying, you want to go a doctor, be a doctor, great. But if that's where they stop and they're in their ongoing learning journey, you know, part of them becomes idiots. You know, I, I grew up in a tough place in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and we talked about that in the past, and I won't get into that, but you you have a little bit of street smarts to you. You have a little bit of book smarts to you. You've been in corporate. It adds a layer to you that people want to just keep peeling back on you because you want to talk politics? Fine, I'll get into politics as long as you won't be offended. You want to talk about sports? I'll talk numbers. I'll share my favorite person with you. There should be in a person some real depth to them. It shouldn't be with. Because right. to me, you know, people can be wide but be very shallow. I've told you that we've talked about that before. But I, I like talking to people. This is why you and I do so well is because you got depth, man. We, I mean, we go into spirituality. We talk tech. I mean, we're black men. There's so many things that's interwoven in us. It's just not fair for you and I to get on and start talking about hard drives <laughs> and, you know, motherboards. And there's no, no again, there's no knock on the tech industry. It's It's great. But there's more layers to us. And in fact, I would argue that you know, who I am outside of tech is greater than who I am in tech, in fact. Man, um, your podcast is hands down my favorite podcast. You're one Thank of, you, bro. Uh, for sure, man. You are single-handedly the person that inspired me to really interview people because I think I see the value in conversation. And I think a lot of times when I see people that I follow on social media, people that I am, um, that I network with, I see the, the level of work that they put in. I see what they're doing and I'm curious to hear more. And then I think that I have a platform that I could help them build and grow. You know what I mean? Mm. So I really try yeah. to give back in my way by bringing people on this platform and getting their story out there, you know? Yeah, I mean, I mean, bro, you and I talk about it all the time. What you do is huge. I mean, there's people that give their right arm to have, you know, a subscriber level that you have, the amount of, um, you know, when I look at your Twitter, the people that appreciate your help when they get certifications and stuff, to me, that's you know, that's huge, man. That's that's the stuff that legacies are built on is when you're helping people. At the end of the day, no, you know, nobody's really going to care about how many friends you have, how many subscribers you have, unless it mattered. And what you do definitely matters. And that's all I want to do, too. I want to create a podcast that matters to me. I want to be a better man. I want to be a better father, too. I want to be I want to be all those things you want to be. And you can't get it in a bubble. You have to have conversations outside of yourself to get it. I love that. I love that. So when we talk about our platforms, whether it be a blog, YouTube channel, or a podcast, one of the pieces that come along with building your platform is monetization. Mm. For someone that we're leading up to affiliate marketing. So I know a lot of you that are tuning in, you want to know about how to get paid. We're going to talk about <laughs> get to 
it, brother. Get to the money. <laughs> We're going to get to that. We're going to get get to that. But what what I want to lead to before we get into the affiliate marketing marketing part is at what point should someone start to monetize the platform? Well, that's a really good question. I think it depends on what you're doing. So if I'm you, you'd have to say this, but I think YouTube determines when you can monetize it Correct. from an ads perspective. But I don't think that should stop you if you're creating YouTube videos, for example, or doing podcasting to create your own either product and monetize it that way or join an affiliate program and monetize it that way. So, for example, on my podcast, I didn't connect the two of what I do, affiliate marketing and the podcast. So I just kind of launched off and did full on episodes. And then I started realizing, hey. I should take some of my own products, maybe books that I've written and make little commercial spots for those and put them right into the episode or join affiliate programs, which I do, and put it in those. And sometimes those affiliate programs pay so much, I don't want to get into buying ads because one of two things happen. Either I get ads that I don't necessarily connect with, like I don't believe in the product or I haven't tried it, so why put it on my podcast, or two... Um, it just doesn't it's doesn't pay. It's not worth it because I can make more money with a site like Rocket Reach, which has an affiliate program that that you sell a ninety nine dollar book. I make fifty dollars on every sale. And that's just that's that's me not doing anything. But I made a little 15 second spot. Hey, join Rocket Reach where you can get your book. to, And I put it right in the podcast. That That's all the effort that I had to put in. And it's an affiliate link at the end of the day. Right. And then I have a disclaimer on the website that it's an affiliate link. So I think people should do it at any level. And I think I don't care if you have two subscribers on YouTube, uh, three listeners on the podcast, you should get in the habit of starting to develop to monetize yourself quickly before it ramps up beyond you i love that i love that you mentioned affiliate marketing can you break that down um i want to get into the ads part as well but before we move on any further let's i want to if you could clarify what affiliate marketing is all right so uh affiliate marketing so this is funny because for a long time my family just thought I didn't work like Tommy on Martin because, you know, I was in e-commerce early. So when you started talking about affiliate marketing, it made no sense to nobody, but I'll make it real practical here. What affiliate marketing isn't is MLS or what I call ballroom hope, meaning you're not going into a hotel and somebody saying buy my 499 real estate uh, package and you'll earn this and my neutral life, get my gummy bears for skinny, whatever. That, that's MLM, multi-level marketing. Affiliate marketing is different because what you're doing is you're building a relationship directly with the merchant or who they call the advertiser. So we'll take Lenovo, for example, and say I join a, Lenovo's affiliate program at no cost. Affiliate programs, especially legit ones, don't cost anything to join. So you, I'm joining Lenovo's affiliate program. When I join and once I'm accepted by the affiliate manager on Lenovo side or whoever that brand is, at that point, I'll be assigned a link. Now, within that link, I can put it anywhere I want just about. And at that point, once somebody clicks on that link, it drops a cookie, as people may hear. And if a sale is converted, meaning your friend clicks on the link and they decide to purchase a computer, the sale is made you get a percentage of the sale. Now that percentage may vary depending on who the advertiser is. So simply put, it's just a process of you earning a commission by selling other advertisers products or other merchants products. That seems pretty simple. Is it simple? Yeah. Uh, The process, sure, is simple. The, the, The process of signing up, just what I walked through, the actual testing and finding out what ultimately works for you is not simple. Mm -hmm. So this is the disheartening thing for me as somebody in the affiliate marketing space. When they get on Instagram, they act like, you know, what I did was I joined up for Target. Now I'm balling. Look at my wife. Look at my house. It's, It's not like that. And the reality of it is it may take a little time. Sometimes people hit really well. 
they have people out there that are called super affiliates that make, I mean, sometimes millions of dollars for the advertiser, which can translate to hundreds of thousands of dollars for you. And sometimes you're only going to get a few bucks when you first start out. But again, if you're, if you're, if your motive is to get in and you think you're going to start balling in three months, it's not for you. It's not affiliate marketing. Isn't about selling hopes and dreams and courses and all that. It's really about another tactic within your marketing efforts. So if you're doing some other things to promote your products or your brand or your website, this is just another way of monetizing or getting or taking advantage of some of the reach that you have. The goal isn't to make a million dollars in the first year. I mean, some may, but it's very, very few, Duan. And I mean, the reality is you really have to put some some hustle into uh, affiliate marketing and generally setting up advertiser links, even now, because finding new opportunities is, is not as simple as people may think. Hmm. So it's not as simple as you just putting up a, a Lenovo affiliate th- link and thinking you're going to be a millionaire. However, if you have a different avenue, like, Maybe you have something in Reddit that other people don't have. Maybe you're doing something that offers a different content publication that other people are doing. Those are the avenues that tend to propel people who are affiliates further faster versus you just throwing a link up and everybody is supposed to find it and all your friends are going to click on it. Hmm. it. It seems like it's a real art. How did you get into affiliate marketing? That's a really good question. So it was by accident. So the the quick version is this. So I got into tech. I was working at Children's Hospital uh, of Wisconsin back then. That's when you carried around beepers, uh, fixing computers, doing all that stuff. I was like, hey, man, I'm really good at fixing this computer stuff. Decided to actually do computer repair. Once I fix somebody's computer, I take it back, whether I swapped out their hard drive, whatever it was. And I just did not like that much the customer facing side of it because especially black folks man i could plug them give them a bigger hard drive than they were expected and they don't know the difference between a 500 gig hard drive and a terabyte so you'd be like i gave you a terabyte and you think they know and they like cool and it's like nah you should celebrate me you know there's a different feel to it so i didn't like the customer facing side of it so i went in to web design once i got into web design even then, I remained in customer facing because I'm developing web pages. Right. So I said, I know what I want to do. I want to put banners on our site and create something that actually monetizes whatever traffic we're creating. So we started a, me and my best friend started a, a site called Urban Knowledge back in the day. I showed you that on the way back machine. And it was clunky as all get out. I mean, blinky banners and all that stuff, but that was the time of 99. And Amazon was one of the first people on the front line of what's what was known as affiliate marketing then. And that was one of the first people that we used. And again, you can see it on Wayback Machine. But once we got into that and we drove a little traffic, a little sales to affiliate marketing thing, I'm thinking to myself, what happens if we multiply this or even niche down? What happened if we sell create sites that are geared towards costumes or we create sites that look just had scooter bikes, which he ended up doing. The affiliate marketing was much better. It was generating more revenue at the time than it was me dealing with customers and dealing with people. So I stayed right there. And then mm-hmm. when I started going into companies, you know, I, I told them I have affiliate marketing experience. They looking for affiliate managers. So that's people that work with those affiliates. And then it just kind of grew from there. So by the time we are where we are today, Affiliate marketing is a thing that everybody talks about. E-commerce, it's almost, you know how everybody's a Forex boss now right. and a Bitcoin boss. Everybody's an e-commerce boss now. And it's like, hey, man, I, I've been doing this for a very, very long time. And, you know, I've seen it go through many different iterations. But that that's really how it started. It was very, like, I sort of fell into it. It wasn't anything I was, I designed myself to try to get into. I love that story. Um, I especially love, you know, how you st- where you started and how it basically kind of led you all the way to where you are now. 
and not only because of your affiliate marketing skills, but the relationships that you build along the way. Um, how valuable, or let me rephrase that, how important are relationships when it comes to affiliate marketing? 100%. Because I feel like affiliate marketing at the very core is business, business development. So the ability to go out and travel, meet with partners. Think about it. If you're working for someone like Lenovo, there are competitors out there. and They're called Dell, HP, and others. So you have an affiliate who has a website that's only so big, and they have only so much what we would call real estate on the website. That could make a difference. Their relationship with you could make a difference between what ends up above the fold, that's before you start scrolling down, and what ends up below the fold. And so relationships are important at that level, but even even beyond uh, just a relationship within affiliate marketing, I you know I'm at where I'm at today because the same kind of relationship we develop, I developed with another guy. I was at a conference and I spoke to a guy, um, and I was cool with him, laid back, just just doing what I do, and. I'm on stage looking crazy with a with a costume on, everybody else looking super professional, but because at that time I was an affiliate manager at a costume company, so I'm 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 trying to represent. And um he's in his suit, looks suave for Lenovo, you know, his whole bit. But at the end, the the thing that stayed on his mind was our relationship. You know, we went out, had some coffee, we sat down to talk. At that point, there was nothing to gain from each other. He worked for Lenovo. I worked for BuyCostumes.com and a couple other things other than just being kind, man, just having a coffee, just sitting down, talking with somebody, just, you know, just having a human experience. There was nothing else to gain. However, the following year, when they were looking for somebody to run the global business at Lenovo, that's the main person that actually reached out and was like, hey, I'm going to talk to, you know, some people internally and we're going to make this happen. And here I am eight years later. Most. So relationships pay off. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I, I love every time you tell me that, man. I love it. <laughs> I yeah. Love it. I love yeah. That. yeah. You mentioned ads and affiliate marketing. Can you tell me what's the difference between the two? Well, in, in terms of what kind of ads are being served up, I mean, whether it's programmatic or static ads, or what, what do you mean? What's the difference between? I know between? nothing about ads. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So let, let's – so they, when you talk about ads, there's, there's different layers of ads. So affiliate marketing, typically the ads or campaigns that are put up – so if I was to join an affiliate program, many people know uh, networks out there called Commission Junction. Um, impact.com, sharesale.com, those are some of the popular uh, affiliate networks out there. When you go out there and you join those particular merchant uh, advertiser programs, they have inside there what are called ads. And those basically are banners that promote 50% off of X product. Right. Uh, you know, a seasonal Easter program, whatever it may be for that particular company they have those ads in there those ads are meant for you to take from a javascript perspective mm -hmm. and put on your website so that you can promote the offer so that when a visitor comes to your website clicks on the link all that dynamic tracking is built into that ad mm -hmm. so whatever i get from the affiliate network and it's built into that javascript that we just talked about when i click on that ad it will do again what's called dropping a cookie. And that cookie is just a small piece of code that is being activated to let the affiliate network, whoever it may be, Commission Junction or Impact, know that there's a visitor at the website and there could be a potential sale. So they start tracking that visitor to the converted sale. Once that sale turns over to a conversion, it just comes back right to that ad, comes right back to that affiliate partner and then that's how ultimately the commission is paid out so there's really no different kind of ads i mean you could talk about different parts of marketing so there's sem ads which you do within google ads affiliate marketing so there's different layers there but they're 
affiliate marketing ads are just ads, depending on who you work with. It may vary whether you're doing programmatic or something along those lines, but it's pretty consistent across all brands. Thank you for explaining that. Yeah. I got a question from um, the Black Cyber Network. Shout out to you, family. And everybody. That's Shout out, family. Yes, sir. And everybody that's tuning in, if you could share this out, um, we would greatly appreciate it and hit this video with a like. All right. The question is, is Amazon the best for affiliate marketing? I know you mentioned Google ads and things like that. But. That's a really, that is a great question. And I'm going to tell you why it's so good because Amazon has the ability. So Amazon, as big as they are, think about it at any time they want, they can change out their commissions. Hmm. So for example, with electronics, when the pandemic happened at one point, they were thinking to themselves, you know what? You know, we're selling laptops because people are working from home. We're selling these items because people are working from home. We don't have to pay a commission to affiliates. So I believe it was back in September of 2020, they either stopped completely or cut down dramatically the commissions that were paid to affiliates. Why is this a big deal? Because if you go to Amazon and become an affiliate partner, and I'm not talking you out of it because there may be some verticals that make sense, but you have to be careful because Amazon is so big that they don't need necessarily the help of affiliate marketers to promote their items. So I would personally go directly to the merchant that I'm selling their product on and become an affiliate of theirs directly. So rather than trying to be an affiliate with Amazon and sell Lenovo products there, I'm going to Lenovo.com directly going at the bottom and becoming an affiliate there. Mm. Just because of the vacillation in the turn that tends to happen at Amazon, because again, their Amazon Associates program or affiliate program uh, they're they're too big. They don't. They're too big in some sense to fail from that perspective. So they don't need you to be an affiliate. These other merchants, to some level, not only want you to be, but they need you at some some level. It's almost like when it comes to Amazon, what you're saying is that they're so big and they cut the rate. But if you go directly to the the source of the product that you're interested in or the product that you want to market you could get a better rate, a better return. 100%. And 100%. And it's almost like what you're saying is that when you have a product that you're interested in and a product that you want to share with your audience is that you kind of need to build a campaign around releasing that blog post or that you really need to put some thought in it in order for that affiliate link to pop very very good point i mean yeah when you're that's a great way of saying it because there's there's a couple of dynamics that are happening here number one using that example if i'm i'm building my relationships so we talked about relationships with the lenovo affiliate managers so i have a relationship to them to the point where they could start telling me ahead of time what campaigns are going to be released for new years amazon can't necessarily do that so the relationships matter. It goes back to that. Secondarily, you talked about campaigns and what's inside of those networks that you pull out and put on your websites. That, again, is very key because that's what comes down to what's going to drive the traffic, what's going to drive the converted sales. That's ultimately what drives your money. So you you put something on your, on your site that I, I'm like, yep, I, I like this saying, but... I, I, I always temper people about it when we talk about making money in your sleep because affiliate marketing will absolutely drive revenue to you while you're sleeping because it's just an issue of you taking campaigns, setting them up on blogs, setting them up on that. But I, I, I never want to give the impression to people that, um, man, just set your links up, go to the advertiser, join up for the affiliate program. Just wait to start balling, man. Just go lease out whatever you're going to get. Get that. Not that's because that's not how it works. Because I see it a lot of times where people get excited. They listen to an interview about affiliate marketing and they're like, oh, yeah, I'm going to go out and sign up. And they do. But then they don't do the work that you just talked about with setting up the campaigns and then writing some content around those campaigns, something that pops to the customer. I mean, think about how you want to be sold. The way you want to be sold, Duan, the way I want to be sold is I want to be told. Tell me a story. Tell me 
you know, put bring me in. Don't just put a banner up on your site and then just throw it out there. Like, right. what is what is separate you? That's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for the variable of what you have to offer. That's the benefit of you to the merchant. Hmm. So here's here's the question: When you work with like a Lenovo for a product, let's say you got this laptop, um, will they send me that laptop for free if I'm an affiliate? And will they allow me to offer a discount with my affiliate code Lab Every Day? You get twenty percent off because you hear that a lot when you listen to podcasts and things like that. You know? Yeah. Okay. So this is this is a tricky question for you. Because you know a guy <laughs> who knows a guy who no no, no let me stop. <laughs> but <laughs> no, but for, for real, for you, because you know a guy and we could work something out, probably we could work something out. Right. For somebody else, it depends on what kind of traffic they're driving. So yeah, they may if you have a low level of traffic, they may even send you a loaner. So if it's a new gaming PC they may send out a loaner to you, but they're expected to have it shipped back. There's there's a couple of different variables, but mm-hmm. most of the time, most of the time, when somebody is just joining an affiliate program, they literally have no traffic or very little. They're, no one is really going to send you a product. I mean, it's very few, at least at the price point of what Lenovo and other people carry. I mean, these are expensive products. Just shipping out a $700 product to someone who you just met. Right. which goes back to relationships, right? Yeah. I mean, if you were cool with this affiliate manager and showed them that you were hustling, creating blogs and content, I'm sure they would do something for you, even if you didn't turn anything over for the first six months. But, you know, I don't I don't think it would happen if you just sign up for the program and then you just kind of let time go and decide you want to get back into it. No, I don't think it will happen anywhere, frankly. Uh, okay, okay. So I want to get into you know the like the best content to release kind of the best platform to release content but here's what i want to ask you i see that you do a lot of posts on like medium.com and yes outlets like that if someone's just starting a, a podcast somebody's just starting writing blogs how can they get their brand out there what's the best way to leverage another relationship or another platform to be heard, to drive traffic to whatever you're doing. Yeah, so those are really good points. So those those areas, so like let's take Medium, for example. So I try to write for Black Enterprise. Mm-hmm. And every article I would send Black Enterprise, they would shoot it back for one reason or another. Mm-hmm. It, I, I mean, I, I could give you a couple of different reasons. They felt like it was talked about before, whatever it was. And I said, you know what? I'm tired of writing these 1,000 word articles, shipping them to other people just to let them slash it down. So the reason why I go to Medium is because it really is sort of my dumping ground of my thoughts. So I go on there, I talk about networking, one of the things we're discussing today. I talk about the price of buying a home. Is it better do not rent? It's all over the place, but that's somewhere where I'm driving a little bit of money on Medium and I'm not even trying on Medium because at some point, once you drive enough readers and eyeballs like this, should you rent or buy a home, this drove so many eyeballs that they actually put it behind a paywall. Medium does. So I'm going to caveat this and say you want to be careful about where you start building your platform, just like YouTube, right? Because at some level, then people take it from you. So I would give it some very initial thought on where – what do I want to build my platform on and where is it ultimately that I'm trying to go? Because it may scale faster than you expect. And when it does, are you prepared for someone to have control over it? Medium putting my articles sometimes behind a paywall. YouTube coming to you and determining what's what's the right content or did you say some wrong words or how they want to start monetizing you. All that is too tricky. So you want to decide how, what platform do you want to start talking about your stuff. Once you decide that, then just start pumping out content. Start building a brand for yourself. You, you know, there's some people out there that be like, you know, they got pictures of themselves and they be like brand executor of, you know, <laughs> sisters.com. And it's like you don't have a brand. Nobody knows you. Right. you. You have zero brand right now. 
Right. So be real about who you actually are and really start pumping out some content and driving some eyeballs. And, and, um, and then, um, you know, then at that point you can start monetizing some of those things. So use places like Reddit, for example, that's mm. a huge area where people work on medium is another one. If you decide you want to start using other platforms, create your own blog and be consistent with that or go to YouTube if you're comfortable with that. So, I mean, there's a million ways that weren't even here less than 10 years ago that are here today that I think people certainly can get started and stay committed to. Man, that's that's real interesting when you said they put it behind a paywall. Does do you get paid when they do that? Yes. Oh, you do. Okay. So, I do, but you know it's a fraction of what they get. Hmm. So, there so you 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 in a sense almost become a an aff, a affiliate for medium right so again i have these articles i can't remember how many claps they call it this is like almost like a like right and so once they start clapping your page it starts picking up within their algorithm and picking up steam very quickly and then what happens is somewhere along the lines they stick it behind a paywall and then i think like for that article alone I was making like nine bucks for that article, but I wasn't trying. I didn't even know they did that. I was just saying, I'm, I want to take what I've created and not just throw it away because Black Enterprise or Inc. or somebody doesn't want it. I want to be able to put it out somewhere that I dictate. Man, I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave all of his priests. I'm going to leave all of your blog posts, your podcasts, your Twitter, um, your pathway to 60k website all of that yeah. information in the description of this video i want you all to go check it out because we're going to talk about some of that content that he's created once we get past the affiliate marketing because the way priest looks at finances i admire um and we'll we'll get into that um so i thank you all for tuning in that are here live with us back to the affiliate marketing if you were starting a podcast now and you were doing some type of affiliate, would you do a blog, podcast, YouTube channel? What's the best platform for monetization? I, I guess that would depend on what do you think you're the best at? So if you think you're a better writer than you are a speaker, I probably would stick with the blog piece. I, I don't know if I've ever looked at like... Uh, there's been so many ways to do it where people have done it on forums. They've driven some really good traffic and sales on Reddit. And that, that's all they did. They just stayed within the Reddit community. And I'm in there too, but it, sometimes it's just so geeky. And I just, I, it's, it's, it just seems different. So I'm not always in Reddit. So that's not one for me. I don't necessarily want to write blogs all the time or stay committed to a schedule. So I don't do blogs podcasting i'm willing to have conversations with people every week put it out consistently every week and therefore it's been a great vehicle for me to do but i would suggest that if anybody thinks that they could stick to a particular avenue that that's the one that they use and even with blogging blogging doesn't necessarily have to be this huge 1500 word page i mean you know if there's enough within that paragraph or within a you know, paragraph, you know, there, there's some possibilities there, but just know that now you're depending on search engine optimization to take hold and then get it out there. You're depending on your Facebook friends and them to share. Now, the only thing they want to share on Facebook is your drama. But once you start being like, you know, I'm selling hair, girl, sell that for me, then they don't want to do that for you. Right. So uh, you, you really have to pick something that you think really works and it'll be sticky and podcasting to me is very sticky. I mean, I got people that are listening in other countries. I have no clue how they got it. I don't, I'm still trying to figure out the algorithm and the attribution behind um, podcasting. I really, it, it is still mind blowing that these people are like listing heavy in Afghanistan and you're like, <laughs> how they, what, what are, who and where and why? So, if you're really trying to build the brain, I, I like the, I'm a fan of the idea of podcasting personally. Nice. 
man, you, <laughs> this is going to sound crazy, but I didn't even know there was like a show notes. Like you would always say show notes. I'm like, man, what is he talking about? And so one day, <laughs> like I'm playing with your, I was playing with your podcast and I just happened to click like below it. And then the show notes popped up and I'm like, ah, I didn't even know these was there. I thought you just pressed yeah. play and that's all you saw. So for that reason, when you're trying to, I would say, educate your audience, how do you do that to let them know about your monetization? Um, because you talk about, I make a little bit off of, you know, the how do you announce that to your audience so they will support you if they want to? That, you know, that's a fair question. I, I First of all, I haven't been consistent on my podcast. I'm, I don't make a great beggar. So I don't, I don't get online and right. beg for reviews from people. I, you and I talked about this, where at the end of it, people are like, also press subscribe and go to my <laughs> Apple thing. You know, it's kind of like, it's all good. I put it out there. You know, it's me. If we're cool, you're going to support me or you're not. I'm not going to start, you know, putting out the virtual cup right. and shaking it to get some money from you. Um, but. Uh, I need to do a better job of that. The only thing I have on my website today at InsideTheMarketplace.com is a disclaimer within the footer that I have affiliate links, which are on the website themselves and within the podcast itself. And I try to make more of a habit. Actually, this is something you put me on. was like, you know, just put together one reel and stick it at the end. Because, you know, at the end, I'm like, hey, guys, I hope you enjoyed that podcast. Man, Man here's the things I liked from this person that I just interviewed and I go into it and I forget all about like, you know, leave a review, do this. But I also hope that if you support me, like I support you, Duan, you never, you never have to ask me for anything for me to do it for you. Sometimes if I catch something or do it, I'm showing love because you're my guy. Right. And that's what I'm hoping is happening. That's why I only want I only like what I the amount of Twitter followers I have, the amount of Instagram followers I have, although you know I was off for a while and came back. And then um in LinkedIn people because I know either you're there or you're not. And so I you know, I don't I don't make, I don't do a good job of like trying to bring pat people back to my affiliate links and stuff like that. I'm just hoping that they take advantage because if it's on my show, then you know it's legit. You know I've vetted it or I'm a part of it somehow. So check it out. Mm. I think you kind of hit on a topic and it's something we talk about a lot when it comes to social media and having your platforms. Is it necessary to have a Twitter, a Instagram or some other platform in order to get your platform out of there and build a relationship with your community. I put you on the spot. My bad. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's all good. Well, going back to that book that you have behind you, Deep, Deep Work. Yep. I, I, I tend to believe that social media is a distraction mm -hmm. to some degree. And I, you know, just like going back to when I first started my career, I don't believe I'm into like the customer facing you know, building up friendships and likes and all of that stuff. That's just not my, that's not my jam. Right. I just don't get into it. Right. And um, I like it organic. I went out last night, had a cigar with a couple buddies, new dudes I met, cool people. We started hitting pe each other up on the Instagram. Love it. Anything beyond that, that I actually have to work for, pay for, do something like that. I'm, I'm not interested. I'm too lazy for that in that regard. Right. So, um, I personally believe that social media has become somewhat of a detrimental tool. I rather not start this consistency of anything that I'm going to stay in touch with you. I'm going to do this with you. I'm going to do that with you and let you pull me because I have so many other many things that are offline that matter more to me than try to establish this like community. And funny fact is, man, you know, people be following people on Facebook and you know, that sucker died. You don't even know it un until a year later. Like, oh, Larry died. And it's like, <laughs> you should know you follow him on his. But it's so unoriginal. It's so disgenuine. Some of those things that it's just not for me, man. It, it, it could be for somebody else. And that's all good. But, you know, you know me. Social media is just not 
really my thing like that. Yeah, we we really do agree on this topic. Um, yeah. <sighs> <laughs> I don't want to go too in on the social media. You know, um, I think when you're focused and you're driven and you have goals, it's important to limit those distractions. Um, but when it comes to building your platform, I think you mentioned something and we didn't cover it when you mentioned it was the consistency. When you built your platform and your podcast, what was that one thing that helped you grow to where you are today? I, I would have to go back to what just what you were about to get into consistency. Like it, it you know, for the first I think for my first couple episodes, I ha- I was in the tens of people. And at first, I didn't even believe anybody would want to listen to the podcast. But then over time, you start to grow it. I start to keep a, a spreadsheet, and I track between now and five years ago when I started. Mm-hmm. I'm just amazed at the organic growth that has built up and the amount of downloads that have built up over time. You know, I get almost... 5,000 downloads a month today right? on average, which if you look at somebody like Joe Rogan or other people that we just talked about, it's, it's really nothing. But if you look at a guy that just started off the premise, what I talked about earlier about just wanting to have a conversation with people, good, bad, or indifferent, um, that that's come a very long way in the consistency to want to reach out to people and network with them and have them on my show as a guest has been vital because the minute you start missing weeks in apple Podcasts, for example is the minute the algorithm does a shift in the back end Mm -hmm. apple or whoever it is notices that you're not posting at the same level probably no different than youtube in a lot of a lot of respects and then you start dropping um and i use this tool called chartable.com that looks at you know if i'm number one 105 in the u.s for um society and culture uh, maybe a category that I'm running at and I can see it chart and where's it going. So I try to use everything that I can to, to watch the triggers. And today I can't tell you one particular thing that has changed it other than I've just been consistent to it. I've just been consistent to uploading good, bad, or indifferent. Sometimes the audio hasn't been at the best. Sometimes there's a guest where I get off and I'm like, mm not sure if we were jamming the way I thought, but I put it out anyways. Right. And that, that's, that's kind of what just people have to do is just stay consistent, whether it's crappy or not. Write your blog, whether you think it's crappy or not. Make your podcast, even if you think you suck, and put it out there and just get better. Mm, I love that. I love that. Man, you just dropped so many do- jewels and I'm processing them all. <laughs> when it comes to being consistent, when you also talk about the algorithms with your consistency. And so they can be really hard to figure out. You mentioned that, and I totally agree. Um, What I find on YouTube is that the algorithm is greedy. It wants more, it wants more, it wants more. Mm -hmm. The more content you push, the more the algorithm will support you. That's interesting. Yes. But I think there's a point where I burn out. I'm not going to lie. Like I burn out on it because when I'm pushing more content, then I'm more involved on other platforms um, promoting. And, you know, I'm just pulling myself in all these directions. So how do you find a strategy that works for you and not get sucked into, um, I would say, the uh, what the algorithm wants and then also the goals that you have set for yourself as far as growth. So you brought up a really good thing about burnout because I'm 47 years old today. And when I went through burnout when I was younger, one of the first things that happened was I found out like I had anxiety at high levels, crazy levels, right? And uh, so between my mid twenties and today, I've always tried to figure out the balance within my life. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, both 
scientifically from cortisol and what do I take, what vitamins do I take, to how do I maintain not giving myself so much that I can't pull myself back. Right. And that's that hasn't necessarily come with like anything I've read or anything I've done other than experiencing when I hit that wall in my mid twenties to today and understanding I don't want to go back there. I don't like I would go into Walmart and the 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 Walmart felt like it was closing in or you know, the white lights that are on target felt like it was closing in. I never wanted to experience that again. I went to a doctor. I did all that stuff. You feel like you're having a heart attack. And um, so because I never wanted to hit that wall again, I figured out a way to manipulate with my body and, um, you know, p get vitamins that work for me, get, you know, things that work for my life, reading, taking time out. But I also didn't want a business – that's centered around giving myself away in addition to working for a company like Lenovo. So Lenovo is demanding within itself. You have a commitment behind the podcast. I invest in real estate and all, all the other stuff we talk about. That's enough. Mm -hmm. I don't, you know, you, you shouldn't be sitting down. Uh, now this ain't me preaching to me. This is me kind of preaching to me, but you shouldn't be sitting down eating to you all the way stuffed. Yeah. Now I, I do that, right. but my point is you shouldn't, and that's how I feel like we are. We almost like you said the algorithm. We we take in so much, take in so much, then hit this wall, and then once you get out of it, then you go back, take in, hit this wall. Man, that's called insanity. You're just doing it over and over again. So I I try to learn early on, like nope, I'm not gonna make commitments here. Okay. Nope, I'm not gonna join this club as much as I would like to. Nope, I'm not gonna do this. I'm not gonna do that because. I want to do this right. and because I want to do that and is like as philosophical as that tries to sound, it, it really is the key thing that I really try to manage my life by is I don't take on more than I think or something that I think is going to drive me over the edge. Yeah. 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 You, you text me the other day or you email me. Um, slow growth is the best growth. Slow growth is for show growth. Folks. Slow growth is for show growth. That's right. Can you break that down? Yeah, my pops used to. Uh, my pops used to say that. You know, come on, for show is in there. You know, that's an old man. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. So my pops, <laughs> for sure, for sure, it is. But my pops used to tell me when I used to talk to him about whatever I was dealing with at the time. My pops used to tell me, slow growth is for show growth, son. You know, when I had a child and stuff, he would tell me, slow growth is for show growth. And it sounded cool, but I didn't know what it meant until we actually sat down and started talking about, dude, you know, we really have a short life at the end of the day. Right. I mean, we don't have long on this earth. It, you know, if you get the 90, 100, that seems long. But in the concept of things, dude, I'm 47. I remember getting suspended in kindergarten and the other stuff that I would go through as a kid. And it seemed just like that. Right. Right. I I mean, it's, it's faster than we think. And that slow growth is my dad saying to me, me saying to you, like, take a step back and enjoy the moment. Mm. Just take it in. Just take a step back. You don't, you don't owe anybody anything. You're a good father. You're a good husband. You are a man on a mission. You've done well for others. You owe no man nothing. And I owe no man nothing. So right. we can afford to take a step back and sometimes just appreciate ourselves. And I personally think more men, more black men in particular. Women is also, though. But I, when I think of black men, I'm thinking of the camaraderie that I, the camaraderie that I have with them right. is you really need to, to, to breathe in some of your success, man, and just – Take your time with it and enjoy the journey because it's going in quick, but appreciate it and breathe it in a little. That's all I was saying. Yeah, I think in tech specifically, that's one of those things that um, I don't know if you're young or if you're just getting into it or even in your mid-career, it's, it's like you're in a rush. You're not. Do you know what I mean? It's it's one of those industries is very fast paced and it's taking that step back is one of those things that is hard to do um, because you feel like you're going to be left behind. 
Yeah, and you're always feeling like somebody has the edge on you. Imposter syndrome comes in. Yeah. You deal with all these different variables. And, yeah, tech is like that, too, because you're right. Before you know it, you know, you, you're dealing with one type of system or router or whatever it may be. A year later, it's the new thing that's out. And right. you've got to learn a whole new thing. you got to read Yeah, all of that moves so fast. And so you're dealing with the anxiety of that particularly in tech because that's what we're in yeah. but i'm i'm and i'm in e-commerce within tech so it, it adds another layer of um pressure but then you just have the pressure of life that comes on top of all of it you know it, it can it can be more than a notion for some people and sometimes you just need to just um i know people be like self care now and do all that stuff today yeah. but i'm saying no for real like for real, for real, do take a moment and just chill, which is why I told you about the cigars. You yeah. know, I, it's no secret. I smoke cigars every day. I smoke at least two a day. And um, the reason why I do it is because that's my moment. Mm -hmm. And, you know, somebody else be like, oh, he smokes cigars. You eat apple pie. Let's have, <laughs> let's have a conversation about it. Yeah. So I, you get what I'm saying? It's like that's that's my moment. It's the way I want to spend my moment. And it's therapeutic for me. Yeah, it is. It. I love. I love a good cigar. I actually love being around my partners or you know some some brothers and having a cigar and just taking in the moment. Like hundred percent. That's some of the best conversation. I met some of the best people, and it's like you said, it's therapeutic. So you you meet some of the best people, like minded folks. Uh, you know, I, you know, I left out of town for a period and, um, I, you know, I stayed in a real nice place and I went out to, uh, the cigar joint and I mean, you see all kind of folks in there that otherwise you, you wouldn't necessarily, um, run across necessarily just on your daily doings. But beyond that, the level of conversations and everybody is releasing and the cortisol levels are going down and you're taking in and drinking in the moment is something that is unexplainable. This isn't the cheerlead for people going out smoking <laughs> cigars. This is just to say you find what that means for you because yeah. cigars is, does that for me. Yeah. Um, yeah. True story. Before we move on from the affiliate marketing, that was a question from, let me, let me get back to this question from Noel Wilson. The question was e-commerce versus affiliate market marketing versus drop set shipping. What's the difference between them? Yes. Between I assume. Those three. Yes. So uh, e-commerce is the full ecosystem of how people shop and what's being sold online. So when people say I'm in e-commerce, they're generally just speaking about the commerce of what's done online. So if you think of brick and mortar, you think of a store, what's done outside of that, this is all virtually based essentially. So that that is the essence of e-commerce. Uh, affiliate marketing, like we, we talked about, is now bringing you within the e-commerce marketing perspective, meaning if I'm in affiliate marketing, I'm coming in as one component within the e-commerce marketing side, and now I'm starting to promote for company A to sell those products. Right. So that company may have, if you're looking at an ecosystem, that company may have five different ways how they promote their business. They do email, they do uh, SEM, search engine marketing, they do SEO, search engine optimization, they do display, whatever's on Facebook, social marketing, and then affiliate marketing. That's just one component of it. Hmm. So e-commerce is one side. Then there's e-commerce marketing, which affiliate marketing is part of that. And that's how you can play a role into it. And then drop shipping is different as well because this is theoretically a company that has, you know, likely a warehouse of items. So you would go through Amazon particularly, you know, or some other company, and they have a warehouse of items. This is exactly what I did at buyseasons.com. We would use a tool called Commerce Hub, and within Commerce Hub, when stores would make a purchase there, we would actually send out the product to them, 
and actually send it on on their behalf. So it was like white label shipping for that for that brand. So we took a costume site that uploaded all of our files onto their website as if it was their product. They take the description, they take the pricing, and they could set their own pricing on it. Mm. Whereas remember now affiliate marketing, you're getting a commission on what's set once the traffic is being driven to the advertiser's site. Right. On the drop shipping side, you're not sending the traffic off of your site. You're creating noelscostumes.com and on there are all the costumes that typically company A would sell. You're selling them as your own. You may even mark up the margin a little bit further. So this company selling it to you wholesale for $15.99, you're selling it now for $29.99. Mm. But you're now sending that order across to that company to fulfill the order for you. So they're shipping it from their location. It's a white label, meaning it's not showing that it's coming from their company. And it still looks like it's coming from you. It looks like it's for f fulfilled from you. It's a white label invoice. And you may have made a, you know, a small amount more on the margins, depending on what, what you set up with the particular shipper. So there's a difference between affiliate marketing and drop shipping. E-commerce can be a part of all of that, though. I see a lot of advertisement for the drop shipping. Amazon, they allow you to drop ship. I guess a lot. I know a couple people, and I don't know if this is drop shipping or not. Maybe you can clarify. They get something from overseas for a bulk rate, and they resell it on Amazon. And when they get this product from overseas, they can look at it and modify it so it looks like it's from their own business. And is that drop shipping? Yeah, more or less that's drop shipping, but they call that Amazon fulfillment. So mm -hmm. if somebody looks up like Amazon FBA, right. uh, typically that is them going direct to the wholesaler or China or whatever, and they don't, they don't have the facilities to actually house it. So Amazon's square footage within their their distribution centers are so large that they've opened themselves up to the public in a sense so that that product that's being brought in by freight can now sit there and be sent out on behalf of that customer. So yes, it's drop shipping because it's being sent from a different location, from a different distributor, right. um, but it's one step closer to you working with the wholesaler directly versus the, the drop shipping example that I talked about you may be working with another separate merchant that is still getting their product from a separate wholesaler entirely. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, is Amazon good for someone that wants to be in small business or yeah, somebody wants to get into affiliate marketing, e-commerce or drop shipping? Is Amazon good for that? Cause it seems that they would make it hard or I'll let you explain. Well, I will say this. I think Amazon is like any big merchant that starts to control the market. So Walmart for a long time, when they were building their brands, they were selling Dr. Thunder, right? And they were, they were starting off. Everything was made in the USA. That's how Walmart branded themselves initially. Right. Everything yeah. was made in the USA, blah, blah, blah. And as time goes on and you get bigger and you start to take more of a, a – chokehold on the market, you start to almost create what's being said in the market versus the products or otherwise. And that's all Amazon has done. So if anything, in my mind, they become a test case for how to build a strong e-commerce business and scale and think strategically about it. And what I mean by that is Amazon was one of the first people to adopt Amazon, uh, affiliate marketing, right. which was brilliant. Um, then, you know, they, they come along and they decided to start just within certain niches that were popular, like books and CDs. And then eventually they started selling more and more products, but they didn't try to sell everything at once. So that was strategically smart. They focused on niche products to sell. Now they're looking at, um, how people look at, um, um, actually supply chains. So they're actually going out purchasing trucks showing you how to own a truck. So at some point they could completely walk away from UPS and FedEx 
because they've completely become unreliant to these different um, supply models. So if anything, Amazon has been a true case study in what to do perfectly when you start a business and how to strategically look at it. And yes, I think to some degree, if you're starting a small business, you still can use Amazon because again, you don't have a brand when you're just first starting a business. Right. So you need, that's why some people are so torn if they want to put product on Walmart shelves because they don't have the eyeballs, they don't have the attention and Walmart does and you need that. So you're willing to erode some of your margin for the sake of getting on Walmart shelves. Likewise for Amazon, you're willing to erode your margin to get within Amazon because you know people may come across your product. It Now it depends on your strategy. How do you plan on growing? Do you plan on living forever on Amazon? Or is it only a one-year test case for you and then you're going to jump off? It, it, it all depends. So I do think there's still some great opportunity for people to be seen on Amazon. Right. And I do think Amazon is good for business. Um, but I just think it everybody needs a plan. You're, you're an author, right? Yeah. Selling books on Amazon versus selling them yourself which is the better approach meaning that amazon prints the book or whatever and they they're actually the one that sells it you know because this in my opinion is a perfect example a lot of people write books and a lot of people don't want to i would say it's easier just to let amazon do everything for you yeah so i so books is what amazon started on and that's what they do so i got two friends one uh Neil Sonny that wrote the book Startup Gold and then Damon Brown who um, talks about side hustles and right. stuff like that. Both of those guys said if I had to go back to another publisher, do books through someone else, there's no way I'd want to do it. Mm -hmm. And I believe Neil Sonny in particular, we just had this conversation and it may be on my podcast where he talked about I would go to Amazon. So that's exactly what I do. I create mostly ebooks because I don't want the hassle of dealing with distributors, publishers, paying more money for the written material unless some, there's a demand created for it, which there isn't. Um, so, in terms of like creating an ebook and getting it out in the atmosphere quickly, I got an idea, I got something I want to talk about subscription box businesses or uh, how to outsource your business. I write out these books, I can put that out quick with Amazon. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I like the idea of Amazon better in that regard because it gets me to the market much faster and there's less red tape between me writing a book and getting it out in the market and online. I love that. I love that. So if you write a book, you go through Amazon and you're an Amazon affiliate. Can you double back by using the Amazon affiliate link to sell your own book? That's exactly what I do, my brethren. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> that's that's exactly what I do. Yes, you can. Again, you got to sell these books at high volume. Mm -hmm. So one book I sell is uh, it's an outsource book. It's for two ninety nine. You got you got to sell these at a crazy volume because Amazon, if I remember, they take seventy percent of that book. I believe it's seventy. I think it's in that neighborhood. I could be lying, but it's around there. They they're taking a chunk because they know the role they play, right? So now you're so now I get it from the book sale, but now I'm doubling back and I created a little commercial snippet and was like, hey guys, you can't grow your business by yourself. You should be looking at outsourcing. Here's a book I wrote about outsourcing. And now I use the affiliate link. So I'm 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 doubling up a little bit right there. But it still ain't unless you're doing high volume, you're not you're not sitting in your chair like <laughs> I'm killing them. You're not. You're, you're not doing like that unless you're like doing it at a real high volume. All right. Um. Let me see. I saw something. Alex Colton said, "Happy birthday, priest! It's your birthday." No, who said that? Um, Alex um, Colton Cutton. He making that up, man. He just he he playing around. December eighteenth okay. is my birthday. I was about to I, say. I, I'm, <laughs> no, no. The Super 18th. All right, all right, all right. Um, but okay. We when we talk about writing books, uh, I don't want to take too much more of your time. But I do so, want to talk about some things that you've written. The first 
and this is kind of shifting gears from affiliate marketing. We're talking for side hustles, but the housing market right now, you wrote an yeah. article on um, medium.com about buying versus renting a home. I did. Housing prices, no matter where you look right now in this market, it's it's bananas. Off the chain. But Off the chain. I was talking to someone, and before we actually get into your post, I was talking to someone last night, and they were talking about when they bought their house. When they bought their house, they were young, cash strapped, and they thought it was high as heck to pay what they were about to pay for this house. They buy the house, and it's worth probably about 80, 90,000 more three years when later. They right. Right. And now someone that's, let's say, 25, straight out of college, or, you know, looking to buy a house, the housing prices are nuts. It's like in cycle. Yeah. So my question to you, can you kind of talk about renting versus buying as well as where we are now with the price of houses um, for someone that's yeah. thinking about buying? Yeah, these are really good questions. So when I wrote that article, I was in the mindset at that point that just because because I would come, I would have people just feel like, you know, I got to buy a home. Maybe I don't necessarily have the credit to buy a home right. and maybe I'm just missing something. So I try to take a step back in that article and do the math for people on there to show you that, look, even though you buy a house and let's take a four hundred thousand dollar house, for example. You are still, to some degree, a renter, because if you look at an amortization schedule for the first 15 years, more of your money is actually going to that interest versus what's going to the principal. Right. So and now there could be exceptions where people talk about taxes and all this and that stuff. I take all that in consideration, but I literally did a deep dive within that Medium article where I was showing people that at the end of the day, the return that you potentially get from either stocks, creating your own business, index funds, potentially could be the same after you consider some of the costs of owning a home. If you have a home that's older than 12 years old, you're paying HOA fees, you're paying roofing fees, all that kind of stuff. I mean, those costs can be, they can get, again, I've done the math for people. I won't go into it right now for the sake of time, but right. it's there for you to read clearly. And I'm just trying to talk to those who are renters and the young people to say, look, if you don't have the money today, don't set yourself up for failure trying to jump into a market because you're dealing with FOMO, fear of missing out, like you are with Bitcoin, and you're trying to throw all your chips in, that's all the money you had, and you're at the edge of yourself. You still can do some stuff by renting and building other parts of yourself along the way. Right. Buying a home isn't the be-all answer. Now, with that being said, I own a home and I own the home at the amount that we're talking about and all that kind of stuff. So I'm 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 a participant within um, uh, uh, owning real estate and investment property, owning an investment property. And, you know, my 10 year plan. I talked to you about it intimately. Right. Um, I don't necessarily want to put it out there completely for the public. But the bottom line is, um you know, there are pros and cons to both sides. And I'm just talking to the young folks or people who can't get a home right now to say, look, don't feel the pressure of buying a home. Exactly. Now, if you're a homeowner, I'm saying, yeah, good. Get that money up out of there. Refi. Learn how to flip it. Go buy you some other investment property. Don't take that money out talking about we going to Cancun. Now, make that money work. You should never have money in your bank account. Go make that money work for you and then do this, do that. So I'm having two separate conversations, but I'm just addressing an audience here to tell them don't feel bad about not owning a home at this moment. Man, um, so let's peel that onion back. For the longest, I couldn't afford a home. My credit was shot. I was in a bad situation, um, and I wasn't good at managing finances with the money I had. Now, if you get in a home, what I what I found is that it changes. I would say it changes your credit. It changes. I don't know. I feel like I have more money now in a home. Right. <laughs> like I, it just seems like once you own a home, things in your life kind of your status changes. Is that true, or is that just in your head? 
Oh, I, I listen. If you if you're owning a home, there are benefits to it. Like because people start to see now that you have an asset. A home isn't seen as a liability. Okay. Home is actually seen as, as an asset. So depending on how much your home is, you got X amount of hundred thousand dollars of assets uh, allocated towards you. So people know if you know they start offering you credit different. They start talking to you different. I mean, the more assets you have, it's funny how the curtain is pulled back differently for folks. Right. Like, you know, when you don't have, it seems like, man, you just, it just seemed like the kids are playing outside different when you broke, man. Right. You just driving down the street. You just feel like Nightmare at Elm Street where they'd be like, one, two. But when you got a little money in your pocket, it feel like the sun is out. Kids are jumping rope. It's just a different different feeling i think part of that is on you and how you feel about your your circumstance but i also do believe there's absolute truth to having home ownership therefore for creating extensions of money and assets that you have for yourself mm -hmm. i like that i like that going back to just finances in general one of the I would say websites that you have and things that you talk about is your pathway to living off for of just 60 K. Yeah. You want to kind of break that down and talk about what it is and then what drove you to the concept. Yeah. Good question. So I wrote a uh, pathway to 60 K.com blog because there's a lot of finance blogs that were popping up. And I didn't want to create another finance blog that just centered around just finances in a, from a boring perspective. Right. But going back to what we talked about before, I wanted to use myself as an experiment to say, how much is it that I could truly live off of without taking advantage of all of the expenses I have offered to me? Right. You know, uh, bonuses, salary, uh, investments, whatever I have, I literally just live off of 60K. Is it possible? So that was more of an experiment on what's really possible. And in in the long run, you're saving the additional money to ultimately create something for yourself that you want to do debt free. So I did just that. You know, we, we took a. Uh, so I, I, I hadn't updated the blog for quite some time but I was trying to walk through I was trying to create almost a diary for myself like here's what we're doing to to jump out of um, pieces of debt that I look in and I, I go in even to the small fragments like okay I cut cable now or I don't do anything like Hulu or whatever okay now we moved out of this place because we're looking for a much cheaper place so we're going to do this here's the reason why I started it I, I read an article uh, Ryan Broyles is a wide receiver for Detroit Lions. So that's where the premise came from. Okay. So I put him in there. So I, you know, I got all, I wrote these couple of different articles because I wanted to use myself as that experiment and say, is it possible? And I can tell you 100% it's possible. The temptation comes in when you know you have more. Mm. That's, that's where the temptation comes from. Because I'm always thinking like, you know, when we were growing up, you know, when you'd be like, can I get some McDonald's? And your mom would be like, do you got McDonald's money? Right. You know, it's like, no, I'm hoping you do. It it, it just, it's it, it kind of shows you that they're not going any further because they didn't have more. Right. And today we spend more because we tend to have more than our generation. But like you and I, I know I do. I have more than my, my parents combined, two times combined. And... So they did what they could for what they had and the knowledge that they had in the whole nine. And I'm always grateful for that. That, that it's the, My parents are a life changer, but I have more. So when I was going through that process, it's only sometimes you like, yeah, but you know, baby, I can just go ahead and buy that now. <laughs> and then we just go ahead and tell everybody we did fine with it. Right. So we, we wasn't super – um, the best at it, but I, I certainly made a very strong effort and was consistent with it. And the other side to this, and this is where I'll, I'll end that is, I don't care about stuff. So you you will never rob me thinking I was rich because you'll never know what I have. Mm -hmm. I don't floss on people. I don't floss with stuff. 
I don't care about cars. There are some people that's like, man, tell me you don't like that Rolls Royce with the white room. It's like, no, I, for him, I love it. Yeah. If he loves it, great. I enjoy it. Me, I don't care. I don't care what you drive. I don't care what you have. doesn't matter to me. And that, that's my own makeup. That That's just who I am. I can't even fake myself around guys to be like, I know with the double exhaust. Ooh, that's, that's, I don't care. Like my son got on. He was like, dad, I got the Rolex. I was like, man, that's really nice. Right. But he knows he'll, and then he'll, he'll stop real quick and then be like, I know you. Cause he knows I don't care. Like I, it's not, it, it just doesn't even seep in my soul to appreciate. I like nice things, but I like what I like nice. I don't like what yeah. people may find commonly nice. So that's the other part why it's easy to live on 60 K for me. Cause I don't have crazy expenses other than cigars. I probably spend $400 on cigars a month. Four, four to five hundred, to be fair. Other than that, I don't. I don't have crazy. I was just talking to my guy yesterday while we were sitting out having cigars. I said, "How much you spend on clothes a year?" Dude said, "Like somewhere between five to ten. I was like, five to ten thousand on clothes a year." Yeah. I was like, "Dang, me, bro, <laughs> a thousand, maybe, maybe." Right. So I don't have crazy expenses to begin with. Oh, man, that's uh, it's interesting. This you don't you don't feed into the FOMO, and I think that's um, a blessing to have that personality trait because a lot of black men and black people in general, we have the mindset of let's just let's just put it out there. Everything is marketed to us. You know, like if you want to sell something, you market it towards black people because when it comes to the black dollar, we only hold it for six hours before we spend it. Wow. Think That's about a real that. stat. That's a real stat. We hold it for six hours before we send, spend it in the black community. And I think and to put it in perspective, I would think um, white Americans hold it for 17 days in their Is community. That terrific? Where'd you read that? Send that to me, bro. Actually, I want to check that out. So Dr. Kenneth, um, Dennis Kimbrough, he actually said it first, and then I, fo I found it online. Hold on. That is really dope, man. Well, it's dope from the standpoint of you, you, it makes sense. It makes sense. We are, we are easily one of the biggest consumers in this country. Yeah, so six hours in the black community, 17 days in the white community, 20 days in the Jewish community, and 30 days in the Asian community. Think about that. You know what? That, that is, I, I never heard that, but that is a mind, mind-blowing stat. I, you know, so that is something that I would sit down with, Juan, and I would smoke on a little bit. Yeah. Because, let me check this out. You know, I guess it's telling, too, because you can go on YouTube and there are actually old videos out there without trying to be funny here where it'd be like, and if you want to talk to the Negro, he likes to look sharp every day. <laughs> and he and there's a real video. I'm not joking. I'm going to uh, I'm going to share it with you so you can share it with the audience. And it's a brother walking around in the store. This has to be from like 1960. I'm going to go look it up right now. Yeah. But so anyways, yeah, again, it just goes back to me not caring much about, you know, um, what people think about it, marketing uh, black man. And there's this video, the secret, of, the secret of selling the Negro is the video that you want to look at. All right. You send it to me. Yeah, I'm going to send it over right now. Uh Man, it's <clears throat> what's up, Deshaun? I see you in the chat, bro. Much, much, much love. He's another one of my big brothers. He said, "I'm." Tell I'm always, what's up, Deshaun? Yeah, he said, "I know exactly what video he is talking about." I guess he's seen the video. Yeah, it's real. I saw it, and it again, not even trying to be funny, but it told a true story. So, 
yeah, again, you you are the consumer of this stuff. We're we're the only ones that consume at the level that we do phones. We're the only one that can sell consume at the level that we do shoes. There used to be an old um, Mars commercial, Mars candy bar commercial. If you're older, about my age bracket, you'll remember where in the commercial they would go, save them rappers. And it was part of like the commercial. I'll probably have to find that on YouTube. Yeah. So that's what my dad used to always tell me and my brother growing up. He used to be like, man, you need to save those rappers because he got it off the Mars. That's all I ever hear in my head, which is why I think in my soul, it's hard for me to be wasteful. Not that I don't waste money. Right. It's hard for me to be consistently wasteful with money because, you know, I've learned to have an appreciation for it. So I don't get caught up in the trappings of like the latest watch, the latest things, uh, whatever's popping for the moment. I, you know, I remember true religion was like cracking for a period. Right. And then I told my son, I was like, you want to get some true religions? He was like, nah, pops, we don't wear those. And I'm like, oh, those hundred, those $150, $200 jeans is out already? You know, so it, it just showed me the truth and, like, this is fake, man. It's like uh, it's like the Matrix. Most of this stuff is super fake. Um, Yeah, man. I mean, you go to <clears throat> you go to any other country where people open up stores and stuff like that, you don't see the rate of um, I would say foreigners coming into neighborhoods and open up shop and being successful in other countries mm. but in america and especially in the black community it's typical to find someone that's not black open up shop and have a successful business wow yeah that's very true you know you think about, about the corner stores you think about the the nail shops you think about all these other stores that's in the black community and none of hair shop that. hair shop the the where you yeah 100 percent. and to take it a step further um, we were actually talking about this today in my family when it comes to the way we judge black people compared to other nationalities or races, whatever you want to call it. Um, if a black business has a product and they're selling it and you go to buy it and let's say the service isn't what you hold the, the standard for them, it's higher than another race. You You notice that? Like this is why I don't go to black businesses because this is how they act. You you ever heard that somebody say that? Well, you know what? Yeah, a million times you hear it all the time, and I think that largely comes from because we've learned to undervalue so each other so much that whether it comes into business, even sometimes how we disagree with each other, we we devalue each other's advice, insights so much. That's why we're so happy when black brothers can get together. And be like, man, I appreciate you. I and say I love you without feeling like, you know, smaller or whatever. And that bleeds right into black businesses. Like you go to a black business, either one or two things happen. You don't treat them right as a customer, because you don't tip, you don't support, you don't do nothing like that. Or the business gives you the bottom. They give you the the, the bad service, the the you know, the worst stuff. It's just I, I think that has a lot to do with how we treat each other that bleeds into some of that stuff. Man, so if you're starting a blog, podcast, YouTube channel, how do you change that narrative when it comes to building with black people, which are, you know, with each other? Yeah, you know, man, the only way that I can see it done right now for, is by starting with me and doing it with my family. Right. So when I raise my kids, I raise them to be everything that I'm aspiring to be as a man and what the legacy that I ultimately want to live. Right. That that's the that's my starting point. Like, you know, you'll find a lot of pastors, a lot of uh, community leaders, people, even Martin Luther King and other people that the one place that they discounted was their home. Right. And the one place that they fall short on being everything that they preach to be was at home. And I think we need to reverse it there and start at home. And that's exactly what I do. Everything that I want to be as a man and see in men is how I treat my boys. Hmm. And I do the same way with my girls, 22 and, and 17 years old. And my son is 26 and um, uh, 15 years old. Right. So that's where I think it starts. And then to me, 
you know, if it's organic enough, it'll bleed over into your – even, Dewan, you and I, we started our relationship several years ago online. And, dog, when we see each other, there, there's – there. I mean, come on, bro. Right. It's going to be all love. And that's just brother to brother off of social media that is bleeding over into the community. So I think if it's organic enough – that could be repeated a million times over. So I don't I don't necessarily have to start a cause or right. necessarily being an effort or do anything like that. Just just making an intention to be good to other people. And I think all of that will work itself out. True story. True story. True story. <clears throat> so when it comes to supporting black, um you your book, like let's, here's an example, your book, two ninety nine for the book, right? Somebody will discredit how much you value yourself to charge a book at that price. But I think somebody on um, the Black Cyber Network mentioned three hundred dollars for shoes. You know, Nike put out some shoes that don't add no value to your life, but they'll pay three five hundred dollars for it. But you Facts. giving them total gain. That's kind of disheartening. How do you deal with that? You know what I mean? Well, you know, the way I look at it is. It's funny because I just talked to uh, a guy named Mike Boudet who started uh, Sword and Scale Podcast. Right. I just put his episode out today. And he is really down about social media and the human experience. And I'm going to take this over to the black side and say I'm I'm not as down as others about what's out there because, yeah, you that, that person that said that on there is absolutely right. Somebody go out and pay $300 for Nikes. There's no value in it. And they will absolutely dump on your two ninety two dollars and ninety nine cent book, but at the end of the day, you know, I I didn't write that book for that person that has a problem with it. I wrote it for the person that said that they're going to buy it and support it, and I wrote it for myself. And I got something to leave forever. See that that's one thing is easy to do, man. It's easy to come on your your YouTube channel, Dewan, and hit the thumbs down button, write a nasty comment. And then what? They go back to like nothing, a nothing life where you're going to keep building, keep grinding. So I, I don't necessarily think I really don't spend a lot of time thinking about, you know, somebody putting much more value in what it, whatever it is that they want versus supporting each other. I'll just continue to do my part right. and supporting you, other brothers. And then I have brothers that do support me. And um, I'll just continue to, to be excited about that and not really focus on the others. Hmm. Yeah, I love that. I love that. <clears throat> There's two points I want to make and then before we're out of here. Um, also, the Black Cyber Network said in 1960, 40% um, of us own businesses. Now, only 7% of us own businesses and 99% are sole pr pr proprietorships or small partnerships our poverty has only dropped 10 percent in the last 60 years from jobs look he uh, man those statistics that they're putting down sounds a hundred percent accurate mm -hmm. and i can tell you though that black folks have been systematically dismantled when it comes to business i mean there were not only just one black wall street in tulsa but there were multiple businesses building up at the time. So and banks were completely against loaning to black people for a long period. Right. So black folks sort of kept starting and getting shut back down, starting and getting shut back down. And then at that point, generationally, you're not motivated to hand down nothing to the next generation. So either a lot of people would just quit and throw up their hands or they continue to face some of the same obstacles. So I believe those are true, but I also believe that that dynamic at some point is going to shift and we're going to see much more brown folks become entrepreneurs, become business owners at some level, and it's going to shift. Maybe that's just optimism at some level, but I think those numbers that they're quoting, which sounds 100% accurate and sometimes is disheartening, also feed into the systematic oppression that we've seen as black people for a very long time up to this point. Right. And we're just starting, we're just starting to see to some degree 
some glimpses of hope. I I agree with that. I agree with that one hundred percent. Fake it till you make it. Yeah, yeah. You know, fake it till you make it was like the media the medium article I wrote. Right. Man, <laughs> if 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 there's nothing worse than I I. If there's nothing more that I dislike seeing online, it's the people that fake it till they make it. Mm. Because taking all the effort to fake it till you make it, again, goes back to you not really doing it for yourself. You're doing it for other people. And sometimes it co- comes across as super cringy. It 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 creates this, this aura to you that you don't believe in yourself. Mm. And this article in particular... I was alluding to a woman uh, named Elizabeth Holmes who started the company Theranos. And oh, Theranos yeah. Yeah. was a, a business that was supposed to be able to give you a blood shot that could take 200 plus blood tests at the same time. <laughs> she literally faked her business until she looked like she made it. She was on Fortune magazine. She was at World Forums. I mean, she was celebrated in Silicon Valley. She was seen as like the coming of Steve Jobs. Yep. And that's that's fake it till you make it at the high level, which is what I was talking about. But what I was saying was she was no different than anybody at the lower level that didn't really create real substance in themselves. Mm. The, the goal here for you and I, Dewan, is to have real substance. I want when people to see me to be like, whoa, I mean, when I when I hear his words, his words really have weight to it. There there's something meaning he's intentional. Right. Right? There are some people where I look on Instagram, I, I know I, I I know it. Trust me, I know. And it's not entertaining, it's not exciting, it's not sexy, it's none of that. But I want all of that without having to give myself a way to get that. Love that. Love that. Love that. Yeah, the fake it till you make it thing is is it's something I don't really like. Um, but I think there's context when people use it. Like, let's say you're you just graduated college and you're getting into the tech field. I always bring it back to tech, and you have an issue with imposter syndrome or something like that does fake it till you make it work in that sense i think you're right i think context does play into it but i also think it it so in the in the case where i was making fake it till you make it i was talking about some extremes but yeah. also some of the ugliness that happens online right. but in cases like that where you're right you're coming out of college you, your resume is relatively nothing um, I don't know if the goal is necessarily for you to fake it, fake it. I again, I get the context that people are driving at, right? But I, I think the better goal is to just build yourself up with some substance, even if you can't. Th- there is a way to speak to whatever experience you had in college to a a, a mm-hmm. HR person that doesn't have to be filled with a bunch of BS, right? 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 There's a way to put some stuff in there that you are part of things that alludes to, you know, I'm young, you know, I'm out of college, you know, I have limited experience, but I, you're, you're painting the picture for them, how this parlays into what you want me to do. Yeah. But again, that requires somebody of substance without trying to load up their resume with fake stuff and without lies. Because if that's the case, the one we're going to have a hell of a time when we start moving the field goal along, I mean, everything becomes fake. And what becomes real? And that's hard to tell at some point. So when I meet people, I want to genuinely have relationships. And I tell people that after every podcast episode, I'm like, hey, I love to stay online. I love to connect. I love for us to email each other. They don't decide to. That's fine. But if there's real connections with people, I love it because then it's then it's real. But yeah, you're right, man. Context is key. But I, I still think there's there's ways without kind of selling yourself to the fake it till you make it culture. The Fry Festival <laughs> is another example that I think of. Fake it till you make it, right? Right, right. It's just that kind of stuff that 
sort of turns me off from that whole culture. Kind of wrapping everything up that we talked about. When it comes to side hustles, right? I'm going to ask you a question. Would you rather, let's say, make 100000 or have passive income make with 10 different businesses or 10 different ventures making, let's say, 10K each? Hmm. It's an interesting question. I'd rather make a salary of $100,000. Why? Explain that. Because I think in where we are today, everybody's on that hustle. Everybody's trying to find a way to make more income. So I think your perspective and your answer was one that a lot of people may not expect. Can you kind of break that down? Yeah, I will. So when you look at... When you look at the job market today, for those who are employed um, and people are working at the job and they say, well, I want to quit this job because I want to come become an entrepreneur. Right. You you haven't even fully developed into an entrepreneur while working a full time job. Mm. What, what makes you think you're going to quit the job and then all of a sudden miraculously become whatever it is? What I much rather do, me personally, is the job or my, my hustles should force me out so much so that I have to get out of the full-time job because this hustling that I'm doing on the side is just so miraculous. But if that's not the case where I still can hustle over here and have the salary, then I'd much rather do that. Now, to, to the point of having 10 guaranteed side hustles, 10,000 each versus a salary, I look at it from a time management perspective. Hmm. Do I want to vacillate between 10 different things to earn ultimately what I would make at $100,000? Now, that deserves context too, right? Because, you know, you could get fired from this job or you could lose two of these side hustles that you thought you were going to get. So you could dig into that all day and be like, are those side hustles one year or two years? Are they consulting? Or I mean, you could go all day, but if I'm just putting them for what they are, I'd rather take the one thing that I focus on and I think I can do really well and work with that versus trying to run 10 things. And then that one thing that I'm doing really well, making six figures, I can insert another two items in there. But I certainly, if I'm already having 10 things, I can't start adding that much more on my plate. Right. The way I see it. Hmm. I... I... What's your thought? What what would you say to that? It's a good question. I think I should I should uh throw that in my podcast. Well, but what would you say? I'm interested. It's a it's a it's a complicated question because let's say you hate your job, right? Let's say you're tired of working for someone and you want to be your own boss. That sounds like a great thing, but there's many nuances to being your own boss that if you've never done it before that you don't know about. So the grass looks greener, right? The grass looks very green. And if you think about it, if I wasn't doing this for eight hours a day and I put eight hours into this, then I should be able to eight times <laughs> what I'm doing over here, right? That, maybe. 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 Right. But if this, I'm just saying, in hindsight, this is what you're thinking. Because yeah. 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 Fair. This is what a lot of people thinks that, OK, if I put more time in it, I'm going to grow more. Right. So for me. It would be real. It would be real enticing to go over here, but it's extremely risky. It's extremely it's, risky. It's risky. I think it's risky on both sides. I think the idea of working for someone else is risky because you're putting all your eggs in one basket. Look, I get the culture of today hustling and having these side hustles and all of that stuff. But I also think, again, the goal is to be very strategic about how you do it and what you do. Now, again, you know me much deeper because I have a much deeper plan. Right. Um, and I don't I don't feel like talking about it personally. But that's what that's what people of today need. They need a real plan behind giving everything you have for a company that you may work for. Now, again, if you hate it, 
yeah, it's a free world. You should leave. You should walk out. But also, you should also be willing not to be able to have some of the same luxuries that you had while you were working. Right. If you're if you're agreeing to, to forfeit in some of that, go for it. But people, you know, they roman- romanticize about the idea of leaving or hey, I ain't got to take this. I'm out of here. And then they start telling everybody their sad stories about why they have don't have money. And it's like, you know, you know, yes, you can leave, but you're also grown and, you know, there's risks to leaving. So let's weigh our costs and cost benefit. Right. It's it's a intro business discussion. Decide whether you it makes sense for you to leave that business or that company right now or to even start your company right now. Does it run the, are you a high anxiety filled person? Do you run the risk of, can you manage 10 different things? Mm. If you can't, I know the idea sounds good and it's on t-shirts everywhere, but maybe you should be the one to only want that one job. It, man, there's, there's so many ways to peel that onion. Right. And I, I think, you know, Gary V and some of these other cats think they have the answer. You don't have the answer, Sway. You don't. <laughs> you ain't got the answer, Sway, because people people's lives have layers to it, and I think everybody needs to sit down and think about what your layers are and plan your life according to that. If you know you don't like much demand on you, ten jobs is not for you. Go for the one job. But while you have the one job, you know you want to do something else. What does that look like? And right. build it from there. Stop trying to just go after whatever the mood is of today because we'll be swinging back and forth with, you know, the new concept of the day. You know, hustle, no sleep team. Nah, you. I told you, man, I sleep eight hours a day, <laughs> every day, yeah. every day. I told you, I don't, I, don't, I don't play. I sleep, I don't sacrifice for nothing. Yeah. Eight hours every day, every day. Vitamins every day. So there's no sleep team with me. I'm not up till four in the morning pounding nothing out I'll, I'll get it tomorrow yeah um <laughs> a lot of times i'm team no sleep and i got a bad habit of that um you, uh, you the man i'm not uh, honestly i'm no good if i have less than um seven hours i'm just not right yeah yeah and emotionally physically i'm not right i'm the same way in to combat that one of the things i stopped doing because it, it it basically drains the heck out of me and that's I don't drink coffee. I like coffee. I'm not gonna lie and say I don't like coffee, but when I drink coffee I get energy, but then after that that crash lasts for days. Yeah. Oh, it lasts for days for you? Yeah, it lasts for days. And yeah, I don't like it. Like my body has to literally get the coffee out of my system. You know what oh, I mean? Oh wow. I gotta, gotta flush it out. Otherwise I just feel yeah, uh, uh, it's not my thing. Beef. No, man, I go to I I go to bed at um. Typically, I try to get in bed by about eleven thirty. Yeah. If I go I, if I go to twelve, I start sensing that I'm going over the the high road. If I'm up by seven thirty eight the next day, I'm good. Yeah. I'm good, and I'm I'm ready to rock out. And you know, typically the day starts at nine, and then at night. When stuff like this is done, I'm, you know, I may be working on some of my side stuff, doing some school stuff, whatever I want to do within that window, and then I'm back out again. And uh, it, it works for me, man. That's why it's different for everybody, right? No sleep may work for you. Right. And I think if it does, you should do it. And if coffee ain't right for you, you shouldn't do it because that's another thing that raises people's anxiety is coffee. Coffee's a... Man, I think if you drink it so long, you don't really know how it affects your body till you stop drinking it. Mm. You know what I mean? If you stop drinking yes. it, just take take a week off and see if you feel like you're crashing or if you need it. And if that's the case, then there's something wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and what I mean by that, you have a new normal of... You can't function until you have your coffee. You're dependent on this caffeine, and that in itself isn't healthy, in my opinion. No, it's a drug. the yeah. The caffeine is a drug. It's it's uh, there's there's no doubt about it. I mean, it's like sugar or anything else. It's it's another drug. But 
It's one drug I take, man. I take it every day. <laughs> every day I'm a drug addict. I done called you out of your coffee habit. <laughs> I'm a drug addict, man. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. Well, hey, Priest, uh, you mind if we take a couple questions for the chat before we out of here? Let's take some questions. Yeah, let's talk to them. All right. Hey, we thank you all for tuning in. Priest has been sharing a ton of knowledge around affiliate marketing. Even share some knowledge on if you want to buy a house or not. We talked about how to be on that journey to manage your finances under 60K. Um, and we talked about his background and we also talked about being black in business. Please, if you all have questions, drop them in the chat. We're going to take a couple questions before we're out of here. If we get some, if not, we're going to wrap it up so we can get ready for this Monday. Let's do it. And sh shout out to everybody that's tuned in. My guy, Deshaun, Black Cyber Network, Matthew, I see you. Um, Christian, appreciate you holding down the, the mo being a moderator. Yeah, see, I ain't talking. I ain't talking big tech. They like, nah, I ain't got nothing. He ain't talking about no router. <laughs> nah, <laughs> I know this is niche, but again, man, um, I talk tech all day. You know, that's my life. I, I work for Cisco. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, I right. Like, I like to talk about things that interest me in um, side hustles. I don't think I really have a side. I don't think social media is my side hustle. I think I happen to make nope. money doing it. YouTube isn't your side. YouTube isn't your side hustle. You I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say. I, I think at one point, <clears throat> a couple years ago, it was my side hustle. I treated it like that. Now YouTube is just something I enjoy doing, and I happen to make a couple dollars off of it. But if it was my side uh, hustle, I'd be really going hard, trying to get paid off of it. You know? Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. <clears throat> Sean says Pixie Boot and the time show for <clears throat> his Raspberry Pi. Uh, that's dope. Hey, Deshaun, we're going to have to talk about that Raspberry Pi cluster in the cloud for sure. All right. Well, Priest, man, I really do appreciate you tuning in, man. Thank you, brother. Thank you for sharing your platform again, man. You know how much I appreciate you. Yeah. Thank day. you so much. Looks like we do have one more question i'm gonna take this let's see femi says what titles have you written for how to shop for houses and basically all things finance so you want me to share those yeah you can share them all right hey um, uh the, go ahead bro no no i was gonna say you could share the medium you could share the um pathway to 60k.com and then whatever else i have for you okay what here's what i was gonna share i was gonna share all your medium posts Yep. Um, your pathway to sixty k. Yep. Your podcast. Yeah, that's a good one too. Because I talk about Bitcoin on there, all that stuff. Yeah. Those are those are three key areas. If you kind of want to get my philosophy around finances, you'll probably hear some of it through the podcast. Especially if you go up at the top and hit finance, you'll hear me talking with different finance experts. My mindset was at the time. Cool. Cool. Looks like we got disconnected for a minute, but we're back and we're good. <clears throat> yeah, it's good. All right. Yeah, we're good. All right. So I'm going to share all of uh, Priest's information, his medium posts, his pathway to 60K, and his podcast. All great information. Um, like I said, he's my favorite podcast because of the type of people he interviews. You never know what you're going to get. Like, the interview with the guy that owned um, Dave's Dave's Bread. Dave's Killer Bread. Yeah, Dave's Killer Bread. That was an interesting interview, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's an interesting dude, man. That that was a good interview. I I really did like talking to him too. Yeah, cool. And I mean, even some controversial people. You guys, I mean, for those people that even listening to the playback of this of this interview or however that works. I mean, I've had the guy from Mr. Uh, My Pillow on there. You know how My Pillow is rocking with Trump right now, and that that's controversial for some people. But then again, a couple of weeks ago, I had somebody that worked for Nancy Pelosi in the finance sector or something along those lines. So I'm not really trying to have no affiliation, no one. But you you'll find some good topics for you on there. For sure, for sure. Um, I, I, around that, I'm gonna ask you one last question before we're out of here. 
and this is for those that may have a blog post or a YouTube channel. How do you reach out to people for your podcast? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I use a – so there's a couple ways. Either I'm using – I have a premium version of LinkedIn. And um, the premium version, typically they charge $30. The funny thing is I was like, I'm not really getting much for 30 so I try to quit. And then they were like, how about pay 15 So if you're trying to figure out a way how to pay maybe cheaper for LinkedIn, that's maybe one way you want to try. But I have LinkedIn premium so I can hit people up that way. Second way is I really do hit them up directly on Twitter. And then another tool that I use is called Rocket Reach. Hmm. And Rocket Reach – you can literally find just about any executive, any person um, that you want to and email them. And you'll be at least, you know, for me, I was surprised how many people um, very high up that would, you know, reach back out to me. So that's a good tool. So if anybody can check it out, it's rocketreach.co. And um, you should be, a, you know, it's a great tool to work with. All right. I'm sharing that in the chat now uh, for those that may be interested in that. Thank you for sharing that, bro. Yeah. Thank you, brother. Yeah. I appreciate you coming on. Hey, Priest, you want to um, let the people know how to contact you and give them some words of encouragement and motivation before we out of here? Yeah, for sure. So uh, if you want to check out anything that you know I'm in, I think we covered some of it, but go to insidethemarketplace.com. That's my podcast. The one has been on there. So we, we've talked tech and kind of his stuff, although I'm sure many of your followers have, have heard it before at some level. But we had a good conversation there. Um, you can also check me out on Twitter. I'm at Priest Willis or, yeah, I think I'm at Priest Willis on Twitter. And then I'm on Instagram at Priest D. Willis Sr. That's SR. So Priest D. Willis Sr., and, um, you know, what I would tell people, just continue to uh, do what you love. You know, we talked about very early on how, for me, I sort of fell into e-commerce, but I really loved it. And I love it as much as I do uh, back then. But I didn't try to run after the fancy things at the time. And even today, you won't hear me talk about what's super sexy unless I really do like it. So I'm not going to you know, run after Forex. I'm not going to run after other stuff. I'm going to just stick with what I truly like. And that's the same I would stay with, say with you. Stick with what you truly like, whether, you know, the one is somebody that you look to to gain motivation from. Continue to tap into those places that provide that shot that's needed. And um, I think you, you'll you be successful in whatever you, you strive to do, depending on what your, what your level of success is or what you would call success. So, um, that's what I would say. Thanks. Hey. Thank you, bro. Yeah, appreciate everybody tuning in. I thank you again, Priest, for taking time to do this interview. Thank you, brother. And we'll catch you all on the next one. Peace. Peace.